This is chapter 13 of The Horse and His Boy by C.S. Lewis. It's called The Fight at Anvard, and I'm Terry Bybo Knight, your reader. By about 11 o'clock, the whole company was once more on the march, riding westward with the mountains on their left. Corin and Shasta rode right at the rear with the giants immediately in front of them. Lucy and Edmund and Peridon were busy with their plans for the battle, and though Lucy once said, But where is this goosecap highness? Edmund only replied, Not in the front, and that's good news enough. Leave well alone. Shasta told Corin most of his adventures and explained that he had learned all his riding from a horse and didn't really know how to use the reins. Corin instructed him in this, besides telling him all about their secret sailing from Tashban. And where's the Queen Susan? At Ker Paravel, said Corin. She's not like Lucy, you know, who's as good as a man, or at any rate as good as a boy. Queen Lucy is more like an ordinary grown-up lady. She doesn't ride to the wars, though she is an excellent archer. The hillside path which they were following became narrower all the time, and the drop on their right hand became steeper. At last they were going in single file along the edge of a precipice, and Shasta shuddered to think he had done the same last night without knowing it. But of course, he thought, I was quite safe. That's why the lion kept me on my left. He was between me and the edge the whole time. Then the path went left and south, away from the cliff, and there were thick woods on both sides of it, and they went steeply up and up into the pass. There would have been a splendid view from the top if it were open ground, but among all those trees you could see nothing. Only, every now and then, some huge pinnacle of rock above the treetops, and an eagle or two wheeling high up in the blue air. They smell battle, said Corin, po- pointing at the birds. They know we're preparing a feed for them. Shasta didn't like this at all. When they had crossed the neck of the pass and come a good deal lower, they reached more open ground, and from here Shasta could see all Archenland, blue and hazy, spread out below him, and even, he thought, a hint to the desert beyond it. But the sun, which had perhaps two hours or so to go before it set, was in his eyes, and he couldn't make things out distinctly. Here the army halted and spread out in a line, and there was a great deal of rearranging. A whole detachment of very dangerous-looking talking beasts, whom Shasta had not noticed before and who were mostly of the cat kind, leopards, panthers, and the like, went padding and growling to take up their positions on the left. The giants were ordered to the right, and before going there, they all took off something they'd been carrying on their backs and sat down for a moment. Then Shasta saw that they'd been carrying. They were now putting on pair of boots, horrid, heavy, spiked boots, which came up to their knees. Then they sloped their huge clubs over their shoulders and marched to their battle position. The archers, with Queen Lucy, fell to the rear, and you could first see them bending their bows and then hear the twang, twang as they tested the strings. And wherever you looked, you could see people tightening girths, putting on helmets, drawing swords, and throwing cloaks to the ground. There was hardly any talking now. It was very solemn and very dreadful. I'm in for it now. I really am in for it now, thought Shasta. Then there came noises far ahead, the sound of many men shouting and a steady thud, thud, thud. Battering ram, whispered Corin. They're battering the gate. Even Corin looked quite serious now. Why doesn't King Edmund get on, he said. I can't stand this waiting about. It's chilly, too. Shasta nodded, hoping he didn't look as frightened as he felt. The trumpet at last. On the move now, now trotting, the banner streaming out in the wind. They had topped a low ridge now, and below them the whole scene suddenly opened out, a little, many-towered castle with its gate towards them. No moat, unfortunately, but of course the gate shut and the portcullis down. On the walls they could see, like little white dots, the faces of the defenders. Down below, about fifty of the calamines, dismounted, were steadily swinging a great tree trunk against the gate. But at once the scene changed. The main bulk of Rabidash's men had been on foot, ready to assault the gate. But now he had seen the Narnians sweeping down from the ridge. There is no doubt those Calamines are wonderfully trained. It seemed to Shasta only a second before a whole line of the enemy were on horseback again, wheeling round to meet them, swinging towards them. And now a gallop. The ground between the two armies grew less every moment, faster and faster. All swords are out now, all shields up to the nose, all prayers said, all teeth clenched. Shasta was dreadfully frightened, but it suddenly came into his head, if you funk this, you'll funk every battle all your life, now or never. 
When at last the two lines met, he had really very little idea of what happened. There was a frightful confusion and an appalling noise. His sword was knocked clean out of his hand pretty soon, and he'd got the reins tangled somehow. Then he found himself slipping. Then a spear came straight at him. As he ducked to avoid it, he rolled right off his horse, bashed his left knuckles terribly against someone else's armor, and then... But it is no use trying to describe the battle from Shasta's point of view. He understood too little of the fight in general, and even of his own part in it. The best way I can tell you what really happened is to take you some miles away to where the hermit of the Southern March sat gazing into the smooth pool beneath the spreading tree, with Bree and Huynh and Erebus beside him. For it was in this pool that the hermit looked when he wanted to know what was going on in the world outside the green walls of his hermitage. There, as in a mirror, he could see, at certain times, what was going on in the streets of cities far further south than Tashban, or what ships were putting into Red Haven and the remote Seven Isles, or what robbers or wild beasts stirred in the great western forest between Lantern Waste and Telmar. And all this day he had hardly left his pool, even to eat or drink, for he knew that great events were on foot in Archenland. Erebus and the horses gazed into it too. They could see it was a magic pool. Instead of reflecting the tree in the sky, it revealed cloudy and colored shapes moving, always moving in its depths. But they could see nothing clearly. The hermit could, and from time to time he told them what he saw. A little while before Shasta rode into his first battle, the hermit had begun speaking like this. I see one, two, three eagles wheeling in the gap by Stormna's head. One is the oldest of all the eagles. He would not be out unless battle was at hand. I see him wheel to and fro, peering down sometimes at Anvard and sometimes to the east behind Stormness. Ah, I see now what Rabidash and his men have been so busy at all day. They have felled and lopped a great tree, and they are now coming out of the woods carrying it as a ram. They've learned something from the failure of last night's assault. He would have been wiser if he had set his men to making ladders, but it takes longer and he is impatient. Fool that he is, he ought to have ridden back to Tashban as soon as the first attack failed, for his whole plan depended on speed and surprise. Now they are bringing their ram into position. King Loon's men are shooting hard from the walls. Five calamines have fallen, but not many will. They have their shields above their heads. Rabidash is giving his orders now, with him are his most trusted lords, fierce Tarkans from the eastern provinces. I can see their faces. There is Coradin of Castle Torment, and Azru, and Shlamish, and Ilgamuth of the Twisted Lip, and a tall Tarkan with a crimson beard. Well, by the main, my old master Amrad, said Bree. Shh, said Erebus. Now the ram has started. If I could hear as well as see, what a noise that would make. Stroke after stroke, no gate can stand it forever. But wait, something up by Stormness has scared the birds. They're coming out in masses. And wait again, I can't see yet. Ha, ah, now I can. The whole ridge up on the east is black with horsemen. If only the wind would catch that standard and spread it out. They're over the ridge now, whoever they are. Aha, I've seen the banner now. Narnia, Narnia, it's the Red Lion. They're in full career down the hill now. I can see King Edmund. There's a woman behind among the archers. Oh, what is it? asked Quinn breathlessly. All his cats are dashing out from the left of the line. Cats, said Erebus. Great cats, leopards and such, said the hermit. I see, I see. The cats are coming round in a circle to get at the horses of the dismounted men. A good stroke. The Calamine horses are mad with terror already, and now the cats are in among them. But Rabidash has reformed his line and has a hundred men in the saddle. They're riding to meet the Narnians. There's only a hundred yards between the two lines now. Only fifty. I can see King Edmund. I can see the Lord Peridon. There are two mere children in the Narnian line. What can the king be about to let them into the battle? Only ten yards. The lines have met. The giants on the Narnian right are doing wonders, but one's down, shot through the eye, I suppose. The center's all in a muddle. I can see more on the left. There are the two boys again. Lion alive, one is Prince Corin. The other, like him, is two peas. It's your little Shasta. Corin is fighting like a man. He's killed a calamine. I can see a bit of the center 
Now Rabidash and Edmund almost met, but the press has separated them. What about Shasta? said Erebus. Oh, the fool, groaned the hermit. Poor brave little fool. He knows nothing about this work. He's making no use at all of his shield. His whole side is exposed. He hasn't the faintest idea what to do with his sword. Oh, he remembered it now. He's waving it wildly about. Nearly cut his own pony's head off, and he will in a moment if he's not careful. It's been knocked out of his hand now. It's mere murder sending a child into the battle. He can't live five minutes. Duck, you fool. Oh, he's down. Killed? asked three voices breathlessly. How can I tell? said the hermit. The cats have done their work. All the riderless horses are dead or escaped now. No retreat for the calamines on them. Now the cats are turning back into the main battle. They're leaping on the ram's men. The ram is down. Oh, good, good. The gates are opening from the inside. It's going to be a sortie. The first three are out. It's King Loon in the middle, the brothers Dare and Darren on either side of him. Behind them are Tran and Char and Cole with his brother Colum. There are ten, twenty, nearly thirty of them out by now. The Calamine line is being forced back upon them. King Edmund is dealing marvelous strokes. He's just slashed Corridan's head off. Lots of Calamines have thrown down their arms and are running for the woods. Those that remain are hard-pressed. The giants are closing in on the right, cats on the left, King Loon from their rear. The Calamines are in a little knot now, fighting back to back. Your Tarkin's down, Bree. Loon and Azru are fighting hand to hand. The king looks like winning. The king is keeping it up well. The king has won. Azru's down. King Edmund's down. Nope, he's up again. He's at it with Rabidash. They're fighting in the very gate of the castle. Several Calamines have surrendered. Darren has killed Ilgamesh. I can't see what's happening to Rabidash. I think he's dead. Leaning against the castle wall, but I don't know. Shlamish and King Edmund are still fighting, but the battle is over everywhere else. Shlamish has surrendered. The battle is over. The Calamines are utterly defeated. Now, when Shasta fell off his horse, he gave himself up for lost. But horses, even in a battle, tread on human beings very much less than you might suppose. After a horrible ten minutes or so, Shasta realized suddenly that there were no longer any horses stamping about in the immediate neighborhood, and that the noise, for there were still a good many noises going on, was no longer that of a battle. He sat up and stared about him. Even he, he as little as he knew of battles, could soon see the Archenlanders and the Narnians had won. The only living Calamines he could see were prisoners. The castle gates were wide open, and King Loon and King Edmund were shaking hands across the battering ram. From the circle of lords and warriors around them, there arose a sound of breathless and excited, but obviously cheerful conversation. And then suddenly it all united and swelled into a great roar of laughter. Shasta picked himself up, feeling uncommonly stiff, and ran towards the sound to see what the joke was. A very curious sight met his eyes. The unfortunate Rabidash appeared to be suspended from the castle walls. His feet, which were about two feet from the ground, were kicking wildly. His chain shirt was somehow hitched up so that it was horribly tight under the arms and came halfway over his face. In fact, he looks just as a man looks if you catch him in the very act of getting into a stiff shirt that is a little too small for him. As far as could be made out afterwards, and you may be sure the story was well talked over for many a day, what had happened was something like this. Early in the battle, one of the giants had made an unsuccessful stamp at Rabidash with his spiked boot. Unsuccessful because it didn't crush Rabidash, which was what the giant had intended, but not quite useless because one of the spikes tore the chain mail, just as you or I might tear an ordinary shirt. So Rabidash, by the time he encountered Edmund at the gate, had a hole in the back of his hauberk. And when Edmund pressed him back nearer and nearer to the wall, he jumped up on a mounting block and stood there raining down blows on Edmund from above. But then, finding that this position, by raising him above the heads of everyone else, made him a mark for every arrow from the Narnian bows, he decided to jump down again. And he meant to look and sound, and no, mo no doubt for a moment he did look and sound, very grand and very dreadful, as he jumped, crying, The bolt of Tash falls from above. But he had to jump sideways because the crowd in front of him left him no landing place in that direction. And then, in the neatest way you could wish, the tear in the back of his hauberk caught on a hook in the wall. Ages ago, this hook had had a ring in it for tying horses. And there he found himself, like a piece of washing hung up to dry, with everyone laughing at him. 
Let me down, Edmund, howled Rabidash. Let me down and fight me like a king and a man, or if you are too great a coward to do that, kill me at once. Certainly, began King Edmund, but King Loon interrupted. By your majesty's good leave, said King Loon to Edmund, not so. Then turning to Rabidash, he said, Your royal highness, if you had given that challenge a week ago, I'll answer for it, there was no one in King Edmund's dominion, from the high king down to the smallest talking mouse, who would have refused it. But by attacking our castle of Anvard in time of peace, without defiance set, you proved yourself no knight, but a traitor, and one rather to be whipped by the hangman than to be suffered to cross swords with any person of honor. Take him down, bind him, and carry him within till our pleasure is further known. Strong hands wrenched Rabidash's sword from him, and he was carried away into the castle, shouting, threatening, cursing, and even crying. For though he could have faced torture, he couldn't bear being made ridiculous. In Tashban, everyone had always taken him seriously. At that moment, Corrin ran up to Shasta, seized his hand, and started dragging him towards King Loon. Here he is, father, here he is, cried Corrin. Aye, and here thou art at last, said the king in a very gruff voice, and hast been in the battle, clean contrary to your obedience, a boy to break a father's heart. At your age, a rod to your breech was fitter than a sword in your fist. Ha! But everyone, including Corin, could see that the king was very proud of him. Chide him no more, sire, if it please you, said Lord Darren. His highness would not be your son if he did not inherit your conditions. It would grieve your majesty more if he had to be reproved for the opposite fault. Well, well, grumbled, grumbled the king. We'll pass it over for this time. And now, what came next surprised Shasta as much as anything that had ever happened to him in his life. He found himself suddenly embraced in a bear-like hug by King Loon and kissed on both cheeks. Then the king set him down and said, Stand here together, boys, and let all the court see you. Hold up your heads. Now, gentlemen, look on them both. Has any man any doubts? And still Shasta could not understand why everyone stared at him and at Corin, nor what all the cheering was about. And that's the end of chapter 13.